right, welcome to week three. One more week to go. This week we're going to talk about the top end, which is also known as the cylinder, which is also not known as the, what do you guys call it? Cylinder head. Cylinder head. <laughs> That's part of it. I had a nice cutaway, but I can't find it. Dang it. I'll find it at a break or something. All right, so we're going to talk about that. Of course, you know, there's reading. I don't know how you're doing with that. Probably not. Yeah, that's what I thought. All right, the top end. Top end includes these parts. So we have the cylinder. The whole thing is called a cylinder assembly. A stud assembly is a thing that has just a basic cylinder, no valves, no valve seats, springs, anything. It's just like the one piece that comes that way. Other than that, we got all everything else. So that's what we're going to talk about. We're not going to talk about that. I don't even know what that is. Somebody Google it. If the crankcase was the back door of the engine, it would have a cylinder. Oh, no. I forgot to get my brand new notes. Yeah. All right. Hang on a minute. Did I start this thing yet? We have a problem. All right. We're back on track. OK. We're going to talk about cylinders. Let me get to my notes before I just you know go off track too much. All right, cylinders. Let's see. Well, parts of the cylinders. We're going to talk about all kinds of parts of the cylinders. Um, wow, why is my PowerPoint slide, though, so like, why is that there? I have no idea. That shouldn't be there. OK, that is a piston cooling nozzle. Lycoming uses them. And there's a whole, not all Lycomings, that's drilled into the case. And I don't know why this particular slide came right now, because it makes no sense. But um, it does spray uh, oil right into the back of the piston to keep the piston cool. So they're called piston cooling nozzles. Now we're going to talk about pistons. So piston, uh, let's see, pistons, talk about pistons. Pistons, uh, let's see. Well, if I had to define one. A plunger. By now you know what it is. I probably could have went right past this. A plunger that moves up and down. That moves up and down in the cylinder barrel. And in the interest of time, a cylinder spelled C Y L. From here on out, cylinder. Just C Y L. Uh, moves up and down in the cylinder barrel. In the cylinder barrel. That says B. That's a B for barrel. Uh, let's see. It, it, and you should know this, it transmits the force, force of what? Combustion. That's very good. Of the, we'll call it the burning and expanding gas. In the cylinder to what? The rod. To the con rod. Very good. Con rod. How much force is this? A lot. Lots. Yes, a lot. Uh, one note that I have here, one source said about 500 psi. Well, I have a range depending on the cylinder and compression ratio is uh, about 3,000 to, to 1,000 for racing engines. What's a race engine? I don't know. The experimental green or air race stuff. But about 500 PSI, give or take. All right, uh, let's see. What are they made out of? Made of aluminum alloy. It used to be made of magnesium, right? I don't think so. Maybe. Not the ones I've ever worked on. All right, they are different than automotive. Heads of piston are thicker. Thicker than automotive. And that is because 
Uh, our stuff is air cooled. Auto is water cooled. And most aircraft. So water cooled aircraft engine, you can put a line of piston in there? Apparently. That's your takeaway. What is it? What since we're on it, I mean, you know, what is the difference between air cooled and water cooled? You know, for a period of time, you know, when I was into dirt bikes and stuff, all dirt bikes were were air cooled, and then they kind of worked their way into water cooled, and they were faster. You know, what was what was the advantage of going water cooled versus air cooled? You get more consistent temperature. That's the key right there. More consistent temperature. More possible power. More what? More possible power and heat transfer. More possible power and heat transfer. You can bring it up easily. Okay. Doesn't yeah. uh, water transmit heat, or doesn't water um, pull heat away from an object faster than air would? Uh, it's more controlled. More. I don't know the thermodynamics of that one. But so why that's important is because in your in a water cooled your car, not my car, um, but in water cooled uh, engines you have a thermostat going through a radiator. So the water circulates all around the engine. There's, there's jackets, and water jackets all over the place, right? And there's a thermostat that's gonna open and allow water to flow when it is hot and close it off when it's cold. So it's gonna let the amount of water go up through the radiator, which takes the air that blows through it. So technically everything's air cooled. So the air blows across the radiator, cools the radiator, uh, the, the coolant goes back around the engine, which you can then have much more tightly held uh, clearances. Thank you for clapping. Uh, <laughs> I know, yes. One clap is one or two. So that is the reason why things are very different in air cooled versus water cooled. So given that, why don't we have water-cooled aircraft engines? I mean, we do, but why is it not more prevalent? Why is Lycoming, why didn't Lycoming Continental go away from air-cooled 30 years ago into water-cooled? It's heavy. It's heavy. You have to have a water pump. You have to have hoses. You have to have a radiator. You have to have an air scoop for the radiator, which adds drag, uh, complexity, uh, a failure point, right? Does anybody ever lost a radiator hose in your car? Yes. Right in a car, it's bad news. You got to pull over immediately. In an aircraft, I mean, that's you know even worse news. Although, you know, uh, Rotax are now water cooled, partially water cooled, partially air cooled. Um, at Rotax school, they did talk about what happens if you had a catastrophic event and lost all your coolant. And uh, I've got it written down somewhere, but it wasn't as catastrophic as I would have thought. It was kind of like you're probably going to need a new engine, but you're good to go. Yeah, it's going to keep going. Uh, for a while. So you have, I forget how much time you have, but it was a surprising amount. And, uh, and I don't have my notes in front of me for that one, but it left me believing, wow, okay, I, I was shocked. I, you know, I would have thought instant catastrophic failure. But I think part of that is because half of their cylinders are air-cooled. They're water and air-cooled. So you, you're the only guy I think that's done Section 5 so far. <laughs> right? That was in the reading. Yes. That was one of the test questions. All right, uh, okay, so uh, piston, the heads of the piston, the head, this, the, up here, the head, is thicker. Here's just a head, so thicker than automotive. Uh, never measured them, but I guess, you know, why would they not be true? All right, uh, two, what is the material? Material, uh, not that I guess it's, they're forged. What's forged mean? Into shape. Hammered into shape, right? As as opposed to cast, where you have a mold and you pour something hot into it and you know kind of comes out. Is forged means you beat it into shape. Uh, it's hot when you do that, but it's beat into shape. So um, forge majority or forward majority the majority are forged. Um, some are cast. Some are cast. Oh, I did write notes here. Forging versus casting. Uh, cast. The material is heated above its melting temperature and poured into a mold where it solidifies. So we can say cast. Metal 
is melted and poured into a mold. <coughs> and forged. It is physically forced into shape while remaining in a solid state, although it is frequently heated. So, cast, forge, let me see. Physically uh, forced into shape. Yes? Do you think that um, as CNC machines get more prevalent, we'll start seeing CNC piston heads? Yeah, I think that's what Lycoming did with that big machine. It, it meant a little bit more to me looking at it because I knew the story behind it. So at Lycoming School, they talked about that machine that never works. <laughs> they said it was nothing but a big pain in the ass for them. But looking at the billets or the things they started with on that table, in my mind, what I imagined is they partially forged it and then CNC'd it the rest of the way. Same as a crankshaft, right? So... It was made into a certain shape that's rough, and then you see and see it down to the final. You know, this isn't the final at all. So it's got to be C and C the rest of the way. Right. So, yes, definitely. That's where they go to. All right. Uh, let's see. Forgings usually have less surface porosity, finer grain structure, higher, ten higher tensile strength, better fatigue, life strength, and greater ductility than casting. So forgings are better. I'll just put that better better, tighter grain structure. All right, different types of pistons. Let me see if I can go my slides here. This one, all right. Parts of the piston. This is an inverted hemi. All right, so, you know, you got the Dodge. The Dodge always brags about the hemi. Well, that stands for hemispherical pistons. They're just domed. We call them domed in aviation. I'm gonna worry about it. What kind of piston's that? That's a Hemi. That's a Hemi. <laughs> really? That's what you're, oh, okay. It's, it's much better when you don't know, right? <laughs> okay, so parts of the piston. Uh, piston head or crown up here, because that's what it says, piston head or crown. Uh, what is D? Also known as the? Bore. Bore. Okay. Uh, these are the lands. We have the top land, number two, number three. Four. This is an old-timey piston with one, two, three, four piston ring grooves up here. Uh, let's see. Down here is called the skirt, skirt. skirt, which says right there. We do not have circlips in our pistons. I don't know where this came from. Maybe an older piston. But this is the piston pin boss in here. Oh, it does say piston pin boss. Piston pin boss. Uh, what do you guys call it? The piston hole or something like that. I forget. Uh, wrist, wrist, pin. wrist pin, yeah. All right. And it's fine. You call it wrist pin. I, mean, I know what you're talking about, but it's not what they call it in aviation. <clears throat> Although I don't want to make a thing of it. All right. Um, let me see. Notice there is right here a little thingy. What is that little thingy right there? Yeah, it's a drill hole. It's like, well, how come the bottom of the piston doesn't fall off? Well, drawings don't work that way. Um, so those are oil holes drilled around it because I'll get that later. We have the top, typically two, in aviation, the top two rings. Top two rings are compression rings. So you have one compression ring, but that's not enough, so the other two. So what does that mean? They're the ones holding the compression in the cylinder. They're, they're the, the main seals. And then we usually don't have a third, older radials did. Uh, then we have the next one, which is an uh, oil control ring. And then occasionally they'll have another one Way down here at the bottom, the oil scraper ring. And we'll talk about the oil scraper in a little bit. But this oil con uh, control ring here controls how much oil is left on the cylinder barrel. If you had too much oil, you would have oil burning problem, yeah. blue smoke. How much oil do you burn in your car? Not Cooper. I want somebody with a <laughs> de decent car. Quarter day. So, Let's all take a moment to thank Cooper because it wasn't for him. We had a lot more mosquitoes around here. But anyway. yeah. <laughs> um, I would say I probably have to put in a corp maybe once every two to three months. Oh. My car needs oil. I don't, I don't burn that much oil. I don't check my oil. 
<laughs> it's got a light on it, doesn't it? <laughs> I'm probably talking the wrong crowd. You guys know that you in your car it needs oil, right? Okay, and there's a dipstick in there, and you're supposed to check that periodically. But I'm willing to bet that most of you who have, I don't want to say decent car, most, most newer cars, it's not a problem. She's like, you know. You barely lose anything. You barely use any oil. It would be rare, right? I mean, geez, I've got a 2003 Ford van, and it'll go 5,000 miles without needing a quart. And then we change the oil. You should change your oil every 5,000 miles. Um, yeah. The other cars I've driven, I don't add up. Okay. So my point is, our modern cars pretty much don't use much oil, do they? Okay. Aircraft engine use quite a bit of oil. And the thing is, if you had an aircraft engine and you went 50 hours and you're like, I don't use any oil, guess what it is burning then? Your rings. The rings and the cylinder barrel. When you get in there and you had a choked barrel to start with, oh, it's not anymore. It's got a huge step in it because you have no lubrication up there. So our engines should burn... Uh, a quart every 25 hours is about where I'm at, and I worry that I'm not burning enough. And there's nothing I can do to burn more. I mean, just sit and let it rust or something. Um, a quart every 10 hours would be totally fine. Totally fine. So somewhere between those two numbers would be a happy medium. Um, a quart every hour would be a little excessive, uh, but we also hold a lot more oil. So uh, we do want to burn some oil, uh, and the oil control groove is... Uh, oil control ring, I'm sorry, it helps to scrape the oil off so you don't burn too much, but you still want to burn some oil. Uh, okay, <clears throat> different types of pistons. Not to me that this is really important because you don't get to choose what piston you put in your aircraft. How do you choose what piston to put in there? The one in the parts manual. Or the service instruction. What if you want to put in different pistons? Different don't. Operator. You're not allowed to. Right? So you just get what you get. Um, and you don't have a fit. But just so we know the different kinds of pistons. This is the recessed head. What are those recesses for? Valves. Valve. Yeah, valve clearance in there. All right. Um, got the flat head. You can tell because it's flat. flat. All right. Recessed head. I mean, isn't that a beautiful picture right down here of a recessed head? You look at that and you're like, oh, it's got a little groove in it. So recessed head is actually that, recessed head. That's why I put that up there. Um, wait, 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 wait. Not, not trying. Let me back out. Um, that is the bigger type. So I saw this. I'm like, slipper type and trunk type. What the hell? I've never even heard those terms before. And so then I had to do a whole bunch of research about what is slipper versus... Okay, um, all aviation pistons are pretty much the trunk type, is what I found out. Trunk pistons transmit the side load to the cylinder wall. So this has to be stronger because it transmits a side load when the rod is coming down. These slipper type pistons are not something that is in aviation. The, um, the cross, the slipper or sometimes called crosshead pistons um, have been reduced in size and weight as much as possible. So when you actually see a, I don't know if I put a picture one in here. I did not. No. Um, they're like missing a lot of material. So we have the trunk type in aviation, which I'll write that a little bit. Uh, okay, so the trunk type, but we have the concave and the dome. I don't think I brought in a concave with me. They're just... Make a great ashtray if you're into that kind of thing. All right. Again, we've got the um, flat, um, which is interesting because, like, this has little notches on the side. Still flat. This is a concave, concave or recessed. Um, they call this one the, well, yes. cup, uh, dome, convex, and truncated. oh, truncated because it's got the I think because it got the chamfer is what I took away from that. So, Are any of this more reliable than the I don't know. I don't know. He asked if any pistons are more reliable than others. 
What do you think the different heads have to do with, though? The Concave. Compression. Compression. Uh, when your when your valve is open. I was thinking compression ratio. Yeah. Well, if we cut out the, the recessed ones, your valve you might. Have Definitely, yeah. But why would you go with? I mean, what's the big deal about the Hemi? What does that mean? Higher compression ratio. Higher compression ratio, right? I really think it does. Has I think it also has to do with the flame propagation and how that works out. I do, and how it mixes the air and stuff. No, you weren't. <laughs> I'm on to you now. I think it's, so because with a hemi head, you also like the head of the cylinder is also going to be hemispherical to match with it. It's the angle of the valves, if I recall correctly, too. Oh, is that their thing? See, it's funny. I you know I'm not. I wasn't an uh, automotive. Uh, Engine technician, so oh, another piston right here. That's what. So you know, there's a lot of things I don't know about. A lot of things. Uh, one of them is stuff like that. What is what do the heads look like on on a Hemi or so like on Chevy or? Uh, valve heads on out there. Do they usually have hemispherical pistons or are they usually flat? Okay. Yeah. So, but I know aircraft engines, and so we we uh, distinguish things differently. So, like I said, we don't call things a Hemi, you know. We call it a it's dome piston, a big deal. Um, and then our valves are not. So, you're telling me that in that, it automatically makes it an angle head. A little bit more. But we just call it an angle head. Well, that's the angle head, uh, which we'll talk about. So, we just call it what it is. So, things are a little different. You know. But big takeaway is, you know, there's different types of pistons. Um, which one you use is not up to you. So, you don't get to call... Napa Auto Parts, which does stand for National Aircraft Parts, National Aircraft Parts Association. Say, so, yeah, I think I'd like to try me a dome convex piston this time. Uh, you don't get to do that. You put the part number that it calls for. The only time when you get to select the piston you put in that's different is if you're doing an STC, which stands for Supplement to the Type Certificate. That's right. And so it's really common for Lycoming, 0320s came in the 150 and 160 horse version, and the difference was the pistons. So you want to have an aircraft with a 150 horse engine and you want to go to 160, you get the STC, which allows you to put in a different piston. And there you go, 10 more horsepower. More power, baby. More power. All right, that's another piston. Isn't that pretty? Big old Lycoming piston, all right. All right, so what do we talk about? Let me see, cast, let me see. We had trunk versus slipper. Slipper is something you've put on your feet. A trunk is where you store them. Aviation pistons are the trunk type. Um, trunk type. Transmit the side load to the cylinder. Cylinder wall. I'll finish it. Um, slipper. They are reduced. Reduced in size and weight. As much as possible. All right, when we're thinking about pistons, Lycoming said, well, they must be lightweight. It is. And so, okay, got to be lightweight. Well, why they got to be lightweight? Well, I think the number one reason is because they got to go in an airplane. You got to haul them around. So, um, but uh, they said constant. I think it's where it goes. Constant starts, stops, and direction reversals. So it's a lot of weight flinging around out there. So keep it light. Um, oh yeah, at 
2,000 RPM. I don't think that's right. I think it'd be more than that. Uh, 4,000 starts. Oh, that'd be right. Starts and stops. Once the top, once the bottom per minute. So for every 2,000 RPM, you have 4,000 starts and stops. It's got to go to the top, slow down, stop, reverse, go the other way. But the good news is at least it stops first. Um, I think of more important, it must have, must have high heat content, high heat conductivity. Well, that's where aluminum comes into play because aluminum has a much better heat conductivity than steel. What's a coefficient of heat transfer? Is that the word I'm looking for? So that's what really works well for aluminum. Aluminum transfers the heat out real fast. So where does this heat go? Well, all we start with, we have um, heat that is generated in this, in the, from the combustion, right? So it's the air in the cylinder. That heat is then transferred to the piston and cylinder walls. Well, wait a minute. Now, this is something you guys are going to have to get used to because we're going to get into a phase here where you can have oral after oral after oral. And the one thing that I will not allow you to do is skip something. You know, like for example, well, I'm trying to think of an example you know right now. You know, how does, uh, how does uh, the combustion process work? Well, you have air from the outside. It's drawn into the intake chamber and then around into this, the engine. Well, did I miss anything? Yeah. Like the carburetor and all that stuff. Right, so piston, how does it get transferred to the cylinder walls? Does this touch the cylinder wall? The oil. Rings, oil. Rings. Yeah. So it's got to go from the rings. Oil helps between the two. So first it goes from here, then it goes to the rings. Rings to the cylinder wall, cylinder wall to the cooling fins, cooling fins, cooling fins to the air, air right? So. Air to the other. Back into the carburetor. Back into the carburetor. Okay. Yes, it goes right around. Uh, to the airplane right. Let me see. Uh, three types of heat transfer. Three types of heat transfer. All right. What are the three types? Oh, yeah. Convection. One of them. Conduction. Conduction. Convection and radiation. All right, what is what is uh, conduction? Uh, direct contact. Direct contact. Conduction is heat transfer by direct. Contact, like direct contact. Um, convection. The way I remember this one is, what kind of oven I have at home? I have a. My I have a convection oven in Easy Bake. I have an Easy Bake, and so <laughs> that's right. And I started making some cookies five years ago, and they're almost done. <laughs> Especially with an LED bulb in there. Yeah. I have a convection oven at home. What does that mean? Transfer means I'm better than you are. No. <laughs> it means a circulation. Yeah, what does a convection oven do? Circulation. It's different than a regular oven. The heat transfer through the air that circulates. It's a fan in it. It's got a dang fan, that's all. So, no, it's got another heating element, but a convection oven has a fan in it and it blows the hot air around. So, go, oh, convection, convection oven, the thing with the fan, the fan is blowing air, therefore, convection is blowing by uh, transfer, by, by mass motion of a fluid, by, by, we'll say fluid, which could be um, air or water, and radiation. Proximity. So you're sitting at the campfire. Get your feet up next to the campfire, and your feet warm. 
transfer by... Let's see. So the radiation, the fire, um, radiates heat. By proximity. It's just by it is, fire. yeah. Uh, thermal radiation generated from the emission of electromagnetic waves. It's the electromagnetic waves of the, the fire. I was trying to think this one through. Warms the bottom of your feet through the radiation, or your feet are on the, the rocks, so the so rocks. It, it transfer by emission? It, emission emitting I was looking for a good story about it transfers then from your bottom of your shoe to your sock via... Or to your sole. So we got radiation from the campfire working its way out and heats the bottom of your shoe. Bottom of the shoe heats the bottom of the sock via convection. conduction. Oh, where's my convection? In there? Like my convection. I know, kind of, kind of blew with that one. All right. <laughs> yeah, forget it. All right. Uh, I'll work on my story there. Because, yeah, it's a bad one because the campfire, too, is radiating heat out, but in some respect, it's through uh, convection, too. I don't know. I must be getting a wire down there. I should not do that. Um, radiation. 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 Oops. That's the whole definition. Yeah, I know. Um, by emission of. I don't even like the word electromagnetic waves. That sounds weird. Oops, that's not what it is. All right, so we got the three types. So what's the transfer between the piston head and the cylinder walls? That is? Conduction. By conduction. And then the uh, air, then it goes out to the cylinder fins. We have air coming through the... Uh, cowling across the top of the fins. Convection. Convection. That's what I should go for. All right, so what are my temps here? All right, temp inside cylinder. Give me a number. 3,000. <clears throat> Four thousand degrees. That's a problem. Because where does aluminum melt? A little bit less than that. Little bit Slightly less. less. Aluminum melts at one, two, two, zero degrees Fahrenheit. Around there. I think I melted it quicker than that. Larry's killed. So that's a problem. So why doesn't the piston melt? Well, sometimes it does. And that's bad. So we don't want it to melt. So we have the heat transfer out. So we got to get rid of that heat. We got to get rid of it fast. One of the reasons or ways we get rid of heat fast is we have valve overlap, open up the exhaust valve, get out the heat that's not doing anything. Remember that? All right. So heat transfer from uh, piston. From the piston to the what? Rings. Oh, heat transfer. Oh, we'll do that. That's why. Right. Heat transfer from piston. So it goes piston to the rings to the cylinder wall to the cooling fins to the air. All right. Um, that is one way. Way number two. So from the piston to the exhaust valve. Oh. Uh, you said it earlier. Oil. To the oil. To maybe oil cooler. Depends on the airplane. If it has one. If it doesn't, then it just burns up? No. <laughs> Gets hot. Oil gets hot, and just everything else. it uh, dissipated through the roughness of the crankcase. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So how does it do that? Well, um, some pistons have fins. T 
ta-da. Under the piston, this is a cutaway, by the way, because like, yeah, there's no piston pin. Um, cooling fins, no cooling fins, no cooling fins. So sometimes you have cooling fins under there, right? That's one way you can transfer it to the air inside the crankcase um, or to the oil, more surface area oil. So some, some have uh, cooling fins to dissipate the heat and some engines. Uh, piston cooling nozzles. And I forgot about this, but and some have have a spray from the opposing Conrad. Oil. Spray of oil. Um, so are we kind of, on our 290s, are we kind of relying on some of that oil being flicked from the Conrad out to it? That's the best you're going to get. That's the worst oiling system out there. Yeah, no shit. The, the, the <laughs> we're, talking, we're talking about the camshaft. Yeah. And it's that goes into that trough and it just trickles in there. It's just drip oil, I know. Yeah. <laughs> like, what? Uh, Bigger Continentals, they don't have the removable piston cooling nozzle. They just have a, like a, looks like a brass or insert shoved in there. It's like, it's sticking out for a little hole in it and sprays out. So, um, different types. Uh, let's see, talking about different type of piston characteristics. So, it's got to be able to transfer the heat, get it away from there, not melt, does it by air cooling. It does it, or transfer to the cooling fins, it does it by um, oil spring. And must have, must have excellent bearing characteristics. What do I mean by that? Load bearing? Load bearing, yeah, because we got this piston, the side load against the skirt down here is going to press against the cylinder wall. You should not see a whole bunch of scoring and lines and stuff. They don't normally look like that. This metal's going through there. So a lot of you have shown me your pistons. Those don't, those don't look too good. So uh, so what are my bearings? Where are my bearing areas in of the piston alone? So we have cylinder wall to skirt. Um, they, we have pin. Plugs. Piston pin to uh, boss. This is the piston oh, pin you're boss. Just like every bearing yeah. Uh, just to see. And. Uh, connecting rod to piston pin. Well, I'll be going through the whole engine now. So uh, we're just doing the just what talk about the piston. The, what about rings? Yeah, rings. What about the piston head itself from the compression? From nah, that's not really a bearing area. Oh, fair enough. Yeah, it's not supposed to rub up there. All right, so let's see. I jumped ahead, but we can talk about the nomenclature. What things are called. Um, well, that went fast. Thank you. So we'll talk about that a little bit.